afternoon to a few of you. Welcome to the community briefing. Duh, community briefing. I heard that come out like <laughs> my, my Brooklyn accent. <laughs> the community briefing. Uh, my name is Gregory Sneed, and we're glad you're here today. It is the 6th of uh, June. And uh, oh, June 6th. June 6th is Brooklyn Day. So Brooklyn, Brooklyn's in the house. Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn Day, June 6th. Uh, so welcome uh, to our broadcast today. Our guest today is Jewel Love, and he will be joining us momentarily. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to welcome to the virtual stage our um, queen. What queen are you for the month of June? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm a queen this month, but I, we're just a queen of the community briefing today. <laughs> yeah, you're the queen of the community briefing, but sometimes you're you're like an extra special. So today is just a she's just a generic. Queen of the Community Briefing, <laughs> Miss Crystal Mitchell. Hey guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm only going to be here for a short period of time because Biz Camp starts on Monday. And so we are uh, training interns right now. And I'm kind of sitting in an open area, so I don't want to disturb the Urban League uh, staff. Uh, welcome to the Community Briefing. So happy to have you. Uh, you know, this platform was started for us to create a platform where we can meet our leaders and stakeholders so that we know who's doing what. And, um, and for those people that are sitting at the table, um, making decisions on our behalf. Uh, this platform is powered by Recycling Black Dollars and the BBA, and is monetarily sponsored by Los Angeles LDC, Wells Fargo Bank, Southern California Edison, PCR, and um, SoCal Gas. And uh, we're always looking for more sponsors, so uh, just let us know. Reach out to Stephen. We have a fantastic team. Uh, Greg, you've already met, and he'll go into more detail. Um, Ms. Robin Billups and Mr. Stephen Turner, who's our producer. And it, without him, all these wonderful new guests guests we have wouldn't be here. So we want to thank him. Jewel, it's a pleasure to have you on the community briefing, and uh, I hope we get to see more of you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robin, and I'm going to put myself on mute. And uh, it's all turning back it over to you guys. Good day, everybody. Glad to be here. Robin Billups with the Billups Group. I, I, I assess, coach, and work with clients to get them through some strategic framework so that they can meet their business plan goals, visions, and mission statement. Um, I'm happy to be here as usual. This, you know, I'm the vote lady. Um, we have a lot going on in the marketplace across the United States. If voting wasn't important, they would not be trying to do the redistricting. They would not be trying to take away your vote. So again, everybody, let's 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 see if we can show up and show out. Because democracy is not just Biden. Democracy is at stake at this point. And I have six grandchildren and I'm trying to lay some tracks for them to be able to roll over. And a quality of life for senior citizens, which I'm in that club now. Make let's let's have a great show today. Looking forward to hearing from Mr. Love and uh, turn it over to Greg. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Crystal. <clears throat> so our guest today is Jewel Love, and he is CEO at Black Executive Men. He's gonna share a lot about what that is and what that means. Um, he uh, has a bachelor's degree in Black Studies from UCSB, uh, officially known as University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, I've heard it also referred to as University of California sunbathing. And he has a master's in uh, clinical psychology from Antioch University here in Los Angeles. Uh, his professional foundation was built on a rigorous 3,000 hour psychotherapy internship. 3,000 hours. And you got to break that down. That's maybe eight to 10 hours, maybe 12 hours a day. So, how many days is that? That's a lot, right? And <clears throat> at various esteemed institutions under the guidance of uh, Eugene Porter, he began his practice in 2015, leveraging a rich, rich entrepreneurial background to establish a private practice focused on psychotherapy for individuals, couples, and families in California. <clears throat> then he became licensed in 2017, and he continued on working with the needs of corporate black men <clears throat> and senior leadership um, and providing a, a, a guideline. I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to that in a moment. Actually, I'll deal with it now. <clears throat> it's good to have history of people who are dealing in corporate America to be able to provide a playbook. For many of us, <clears throat> you had to figure it out along the way. There were very few there 
So to have the uh, uh, take advantage of the wisdom that somebody else has gained uh, from uh, working in an environment to provide uh, expertise is, I think, uh, priceless. So certainly uh, we're on the, we'll be on the edge of our seats uh, listening to uh, the wisdom that he's going to uh, give to us uh, very shortly. Uh, his areas of specialization include uh, treating depression, anxiety, and a broad spectrum of uh, mental health issues. In 2022, he shifted his focus towards executive coaching uh, after training with the Coaching Leadership Academy and uh, expanding his team to meet the demand. He had to hire five additional black male coaches. And so he also hosts the Black Executive Man podcast. Uh, so he's got about 1,000 downloads per month, over 2,000 2, or 20,000 subscribers. I saw both uh, listed as I was doing my research. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there and uh, let him, you know, he's done a number of things and I could go on and on. Sometimes we have people and their their LinkedIn profile is just not even a, a third of a page. And then some folks have five, six pages. He's got five, six pages and we would be here to the end going through all of it. So without further delay, uh, please join me and welcoming Jewel Love and, yet, and explain to me about the history of the name. Is there another Jewel Love out there? Um, and he also said, oh, one more thing. He also said that he has African-American and Scottish Canadian roots. So he's the United Nations all, all, uh, all wrapped up into one. Uh, and he grew up in the San Francisco Bay area. So please join me in welcoming Jewel Love to the virtual stage. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, you, you all are lucky to have coach Greg. This is, <laughs> this is already entertaining. Uh, I, I love it. And University of Sunbathing is absolutely accurate as well. I've never heard that before, but that's 100% accurate as well. So you definitely uh, got that down. In terms of even my name, uh, yes, I'm Jewel Love Jr. So my dad, he was raised in Chicago, born in Missouri, and he got his name from his, his grandmother. So the name has been coming down the, the, the generations for a while. I don't know how he got that name. Uh, I mean, why she gave him that name exactly, but- um, He was a been, jewel in somebody's eye, I imagine. Boom, and there we go. We just, and, we just landed and, that plane. And filled with love, so there we go. We're in, we're in Missouri, so, because we got a, we got a um, is it a Missourian in the house? <laughs> Too, not too sure, actually. Uh, so most of his time was spent in uh, Chicago, Robbins, uh, outside of Chicago, uh, Robbins, Illinois, before uh, moving to Oakland, California. So it, I think he was very young when he moved, so they didn't talk about it too, too much. They just said for racial reasons, it was time. It's time to go. So, <laughs> so they went. Yeah, Robin's from St. Louis, so I thought uh, there might have been a St. Louis kind of synergy there, but uh, all right, your show. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you all very much for taking the time, of course, to, to, to be here and for us to have this, this dialogue here today. An important conversation, one I am sure that many of you are already familiar with, and it's the, the corporate world. So growing up in Oakland, California, uh, we grew up very humble economically. So, you know, I didn't grow up with an uncle you know, who's a VP earning like $700,000, including equity at Google. That just was not a part of my reality. Uh, my dad was an entrepreneur, small time, and uh, my mom was a paralegal assistant. So very economically humble. After I did my education at UC Santa Barbara, um, at that time, uh, uh, majoring in black studies, uh, being really active in the black community as far as student politics was huge for me. I helped co-found the UC African Black Coalition, which brought together the African student unions and black student unions throughout the UC school system. And now it's extended to California State and other states as well. And I noticed that at that time, uh, even though we were winning many of our campaigns, I'm going to be, I, I love that how transparent I can be here is there was a there was just a there was a lot of hate that I had in my in my heart and it was it was very useful in organizing but it was it was tearing me up inside personally me it was just you know life so you know I'm studying black history every day and I'm so upset by what I'm learning and hearing and then I'm 
using that upset to really force change uh, in the Santa Barbara community. And it was effective, but I knew I was going to need a different angle in a different way and that my gift was going to be something different. My impact, my contribution would need to come in a different way. And I needed to find that. So I actually left like the kind of maybe like formal politics kind of world or activism world. And I started studying about different religious traditions. Now, I was born in a Buddhist community in the Bay Area. And so in my mid 20s, I wanted to study other traditions and cultures and backgrounds. And I did that. And I ultimately landed on psychotherapy. Now, I don't know if you all have been to psychotherapy or therapy before, but I hadn't. I had roughly heard of it, but it was another universe to me. And I ended up going to therapy for two and a half years and it absolutely changed my life. It was so profound to know that I could make internal changes, if you will, or changes in the way that I thought about things. And it would improve my relationships, my ability for job performance, uh, to grow in my career, you name it. It was so profound for me. I decided to answer that call and got my master's in clinical psych and started Black Executive Men. But then that was back in Oakland, California. Now, I wasn't that familiar with Brothers in Corporate America. I, I just wasn't that familiar. And so one of my first clients uh, for psychotherapy, treating anxiety, depression, things of this nature, he was a brother that had graduated from Harvard Business School, right? Phenomenal. Uh, he came from a two parent uh, family, upper middle class, had gone to private schools, was about to get married. I mean, he had everything like perfect. I was like, this is incredible. Who is this guy? And yet he was so humble and so impact driven at the same time. And I was like, this guy is incredible. I want to spend more of my time around these guys. And so that's really when Black Executive Men as a brand was born. And I started uh, meeting with more corporate brothers and learning about the corporate world. Simple stuff, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, C-suite, board roles, bottom line, skip level manager. I didn't know any of this. I'm, I'm writing it down during the sessions and they're teaching me while I'm helping them with their anxiety, depression, et cetera. So I do this for six years and I start doing black mental health workshops at um, NVIDIA and PayPal and Medtronic and Google and Microsoft and uh, Upwork and other organizations as well. And after about six years, I say, I want to pivot to coaching. Um, there is more money in coaching. And from the healing perspective, I was kind of healed out in talking about those topics. It was just, I, I, I needed a shift and a change. So then I started focusing on helping guys to make more money in terms of raises, promotions, but impact as well. And really building out a world-class brand where they could be their authentic self in the corporate environment. So not a not an, an easy thing to do necessarily, but be compensated very well for it. And in my work, working with brothers Monday through Friday, maybe up to five you know, clients, maybe up to six clients a day, I literally got a front row view on who was doing really well in the habits and the mindsets that they had. That I mean, we could talk about guys that come out of the same grad school or same you know, bachelor's program and go in very different directions. And some guys would cap out at mid uh, management and some guys would reach the very top. We're talking sea level, which is anything Fortune 500 or 2000 is, you all know, extraordinarily competitive. But something enabled them to get to the top. And I started to distill it down to some principles. And then I started to share that on the podcast. So podcast is about two, I think, I think now we're at about uh, don't quote me on this. I need to check the stats, but I think about 2000 downloads a month. Um, and then in terms of my followers overall, LinkedIn, that's around 20,000. And I started to share it every day on LinkedIn and built a community around it. So now I have this community. It's called Black Executive Man Community. It's currently free, absolutely free to join. And there's 240 uh, corporate brothers inside of this community. We're very chatty. We talk almost every day. Um, this is your network, please. Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, 
in terms of this network, it's called the Black Executive Men uh, Community. And it's very easy to join. And we can drop it in the chat as well. It's blackexecutivemen.com slash community. And you got guys that are across different uh, industries. We do have some nonprofit and some government guys and a few military guys in there as well, but it's mainly corporate. And we also have, uh, so we have about 20 regional groups and those groups have quarterly socials and it's absolutely free. Each uh, region has a leader to it and they plan the social and get guys together. One of the unique pieces that uh, I find powerful about these socials, and then I wanna to get to the educational groups, which are particularly helpful, is at the socials, one of the things that we forward is friendship. It's friendship. Now, friendship's kind of like a third grade concept, right? You got your best friends, you got the tree house, the clubhouse, and there's, you know, you did the snacks and the lunchables and all that kind of stuff, friends, right? But as a psychotherapist, and studying our community specifically in terms of black men, but men even in general, they talk about the epidemic of loneliness amongst you. We're going deep, folks, or why else, right? Epidemic of loneliness amongst men. And I even remember a few brothers committed suicide that I went to college with. These are black men committed suicide and they were struggling. And so many of these guys in corporate even though on paper it looks like they're doing phenomenal, they may have a, they may be lonely, frankly, or isolated, or their friendships could be superficial. And guys, I know we don't like to put ourselves in that box, but when we talk about authentic, deep, real, meaningful connections, as we grow older into our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it can be harder to make friends. I mean, let's talk about it. You go to the gym, you got 245, I mean, you're still crushing it, right? You're on your, you know, eighth rep. You look over the guy next to you said, you know, night, right, man, you're hitting it today. Yeah, man, and you're have a great conversation. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? I was in the military. I was in the military. I'm in this fraternity. I'm in the incredible. Talk about, well, let's, you know, exchange numbers and, and, and meet up sometime. And for us, that's usually where it starts to taper off in terms of, well, maybe we'll just keep it at the gym. You know, hey, I don't know what his intention really is, right? That stuff starts to, and then guys end up isolated. So friendship, especially in a corporate and a business community, we found to be our secret sauce. And guys being able to uh, lower the guard and lower the barrier in terms of what's he going to sell me? What does he want? What is he, you know, he's trying to get in my network and move around. And I don't know the guy. So we're not worried about really any of that because the focus is on friendship first, business second. So that's really the format. And at the actual socials we have, the first thing is called a toast. And that's where guys get to toast for what's going well in their life, in the group. These can be brand new strangers. And they get to toast and guys will toast to their success. The second thing is asking for support. If they're looking for some support in terms of a new job or they're looking for funding for their startup, uh, they can get support on where to go find those resources. And the third thing it's called tributes. Tributes are sharing with another brother in the group what they appreciate about him specifically, publicly for everybody to hear and not only what he appreciates, but how it impacts his life. Uh, you know, Mark, you know, I've been, you know, seeing you in the community, been hearing you talk about your kids. You know, it seems pretty clear to me, you're a wonderful father. And that inspires me to be a better father uh, and a better husband uh, in my own family as well. And so these are tributes. What we're doing is we're building and creating the strands of what we call relational capital. Relational capital. And with the foundation of relational capital, we're finding that financial capital flows with a lot more ease when people actually know each other and have real relationships with each other. It's bringing that village concept, that community concept, uh, forth in very practical ways. I could go on and on about that, but I, I, I don't want to miss the piece about our educational groups. So these things are not just willy-nilly and a free-for-all. Um, I've tried that and it usually 
just kind of falls apart pretty quickly. So we have a facilitator and all of these are led by black men and all of the speakers are black men as well. So we have a, a facilitator for each group. He welcomes every new guy that comes into the group, learns a little bit about him. And then we have our speakers that uh, it's a weekly speaker series. So it's kind of like this community here, but it's on certain topics. The topics we have are health and fitness, right? That's important. Personal finance, okay, that's key. Uh, we have professional development. We have real estate. I know some of you ears are, ears are going to perk up to that. That's very important as well. Uh, we have investing in Africa. Uh, we have job search for the guys that are searching for work. And um, I think that's seven. So we, we have one more as well. We have eight total. Artificial intelligence. Hello. That's the hot topic right now. And so every single week we have new speakers, they talk for 10 to 20 minutes, not a ton of time, and then we lead into Q&A. And guys get to be chatty with one another, they get to build real relationships, and you know, they're going to be doing business, and they start to do business as well. So I just wanted to give you all kind of this timeline, if you will, in terms of my own life, and then how it led from therapy to coaching, and then from coaching to community building which is where it's at today. And we're looking to expand uh, bit by bit. We're not in a rush. We're looking to make sure the quality is high. And then when that really locks in, we'll be looking to uh, expand even further. So I just wanted to share in terms of you know my business, uh, that really is the primary thing is I'm a community builder. Uh, I'm a caring person. I'm a, I'm, I'll say it. I think I could say it here. I'm a powerful person, right? We can talk like that here as well. Um, but I think it's built in power plus care is I know unlocks potential alongside skill set. I'm, I'm actually technically skilled at what I do. Greg you talked about 3000 hours. So I have the training uh, to back it up as well. Uh, just a few more pieces. Do I got a couple more minutes, Greg, or do I need yes. to wrap? Nope, nope. Yeah. Okay. So just a couple more pieces is uh, I'm still working on my uh, book, got the first draft done. And uh, this is called Born Driven, the Executive Blueprint for Black Men in Corporate America. And uh, this is basically the different pillars that I picked up from my clients. So it's not mine. I don't have a bunch of experience in corporate America. I'm very transparent with my audience about that as well. But really to put it into this book, for guys to read uh, near and far. But when we talk about what's the bigger mission here? What's the bigger picture here? And I think what it is, and I was thinking about it the other night as well, as it's still clarifying, is really to help us build out not only a mindset, but opportunities that when we're working together and when we're in genuine relationship, authentic connection, with one another and supporting one another, of course, in business, but also in life, also in life, because that's right underneath the surface of business, relationships, health, mental health, these pieces too, that we can unlock an economic juggernaut. And I know we've heard that in our community before, and we've had successes and we've had failures and we've had everything in between. But when you look at the potential that we have to come together and provide opportunities for one another to succeed and thrive, I just don't think it can be ignored. So that really is the underlying uh, aim and philosophy is to, like many other communities, unlock the financial juggernaut, but specifically with brothers that are in the corporate realm and make it cool. I, folks, this is, a, this is my controversial statement of the day to make it cool to be in corporate. When I grew up, that you could buy Jordans. Yes. You could buy gas from Chevron. <laughs> you could go to Applebee's. You could buy the ribs platter with the extra barbecue sauce and the, the greasy zesty fries on the side and the Coca-Cola phenomenal. But to work there was a problem. And you all may not have grown up that way, but somehow, that became a part of the kind of culture surrounding that I grew up in. And to work for corporate was not cool. But I tell you, seeing the guys that I see on a daily basis, these are, I would say, I gotta, I gotta find a way, a different way to phrase it. I, in my mind, these are our heroes. 
These are heroes, folks, in our community. We're talking financially well off. I'm telling you, it must be 80, 90% family, family men, married, kids, homeowners, morally on the, on the up and phenomenal men. And I think we hear, I hear so little about this hidden class of black men in our general, in our community in general. So for me, creating the platform, not only for us to be together and support one another in an authentic way, and of course, a business way, but ultimately in some way, shape or form, I don't have all the answers, but to get that image out there, that's the impact that um, I think I could just have full like satisfaction and peace in my heart around having that type of an impact. So I'll go ahead and kind of wind down um, from there, but I just wanted to share these pieces. And I'm so glad I got this invitation uh, to be with this thoughtful community here today. Thank you. So a few, obviously, uh, follow questions. Um, if I'm hearing you correctly, sounds like you have a, a coaching business and then you also are doing the uh, black executive men, is that correct? Yeah, so coaching pays the bills uh, until the community pays the bills. Right. Um, so then spend a few minutes on your coaching practice itself. Uh, it's kind of your, uh, your, your two minute uh, commercial uh, without having to pay a fee. <laughs> oh, I'm on it. Love it. So folks, <laughs> buckle up. Um, in terms of the coaching, um, so this primarily is for brothers that are mid-level uh, management that are looking to reach the C-suite. Uh, we talk about putting their seven-figure blueprint to get, that's right, folks, seven, not six, seven-figure blueprint. Say, Joel, how did you come up with that number? Well, there's a few brothers I was working with that were making seven figures. I mean, these were, the, these were the strong silence types. You, they didn't post on LinkedIn, nothing like that. But they were doing very, very well financially. I said, wow, that's possible for us too. So seven bigger blueprint. So some of the things that I help guys with is um, they are still some basic things of really identifying that end goal role that will lead them to a seven figure income. Some guys are just not on that track and they haven't considered it. Um, and then one of the huge things that I help them with is building out a world class brand. So their podcast. World class what? Oh, yeah, brand. Brand. Okay, yeah. So building out their uh, media kit, their podcast, their podcast tour, their newsletter, their thought leadership on LinkedIn. So they can start doing um, conferences if they want to get into consulting, if they're looking to get a new role, they can leverage their personal brand in order to help them move forward in their W-2 uh, role as well. One of the, and I'll end with this piece, is uh, I'd say biggest in, uh, outcomes of working with me is uh, something that's more internal. It's this feeling of increased confidence and guys really do leave believing in a certain way, kind of um, in a way anything is possible for them for their career because now their career is in their hands and not in their boss's hands, their manager's hands, and certainly not the company they work for's hands. It's in their own hands and they get to craft and create how they want their career to go uh, moving forward. So just a bit about the coaching, it just you know whittles down into one-on-one -on -one 50 minute coaching accelerated program. If you're interested, you can reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, if you can find me, I'm the only male jewel love you will find on LinkedIn. So you can find me there as well. Thank you. Um, and you, you did well there on the on your commercial there. Uh, and we'll get <laughs> the um, uh, maybe Stephen or somebody help me out putting that uh, link in the uh, in the chat. So for the mid-level um, black, I guess managers, directors, they wouldn't uh, just below, I guess, the executive level. Uh, share with us maybe the top three biggest challenges that they are facing um, that uh, you're able to help them with, or just in general, what are those? What are the top three challenges? 
Yeah, so the very first one, I'm taking a few notes on that as we talk here. The very first one is really their network. See, we've been sold so hard on meritocracy, which is a great thing in terms of doing all we can to advance. So in terms of the different pillars of success, we call that the 100% formula, 100% formula. That means giving it 100%, doing what you can. But the reality is it's not all the time, but many times moving from uh, mid-manager, so manager, director, maybe individual contributor to a VP, definitely a C-level role, it mainly, it often comes through one's network. And so guys are focused so hard on doing their job well, and they see people, you know, kind of flying up the ladder beside them and don't realize that corporate in many ways is so much like a club, like this club, if you will. It's people that are getting together in private circles or exclusive spaces that are talking and getting to know one another and are sharing opportunities, uh, job referrals and resources with one another. So that's the first thing that I do is I usually connect them directly to brothers who are in the C-suite, uh, VP roles, director roles at companies they want to work at if I have those connections to expand their network beyond their four or five friends or you know their line brothers or um, the people that they're working with to really expand their network and open up their mind to what's possible in terms of referrals and opportunities. Once they lock in that, they usually get how important it is to work their network and build that uh, over time. It's one of the greatest assets that, that we have, as you all know, as professionals. I'd say the next thing, it's really around earning. So this is the conversation around money and they may be earning the most money out of anyone in their family. Uh, they may be the first one that have gotten their MBA. And so they may reach 175K and think, you know, this is it. Like I, I've arrived. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, what else could there be? And we start talking about, well, the guy who just came in before you was making 500,000 dollars as an engineer at, at Netflix. And the guy over there uh, is making 600 is, I don't know, VP. I'm just, you know, kind of making stuff up, uh, not making up the ranges, but just like this specific, in, you know, like VP at Google or something like that. Um, but there are guys making millions of dollars and I expose them to these guys and say, well, have you thought about making seven figures? Have you thought about making a hundred thousand more? And I get their mind to think that probably number one, it's okay to do so. It's okay to be driven to earn more. And for many of you guys, that's kind of a taboo thought in their, in their mind. But we really work on that and kind of massage that thought and get them uh, aligned to making more money. It's okay. And so I'd say that would be the second thing and then helping them to plan that out. Then the last piece of the puzzle is so we got networking we got the money mindset yeah i'd say the last thing is something i've already covered which is really around their brand versus their um, aligning themselves with their own brand as opposed to aligning themselves with their corporate brand so guys may come into the room and introduce themselves as i work for this company this is who i am so they kind of got it reversed a bit and that's important right the company i went to harvard i work at you know chevron you know, I am, you know, a, even a member of this fraternity or this club, and those things are all important, but I really help guys to center their own name as the most important brand that they have and to build up value around their own brand. That could be, that's, that is typically their name, but also what they're known for in their industry. We talk about being the best in the world at what they do. And so what networks, would they have to have? What conferences would they need to be speaking at? What trainings would they need to go through? What positioning would their LinkedIn profile need to have for them to be positioned at the, in, as the best in the world at what they do? So that's the final piece, but it's a really important piece in terms of their personal brand and their positioning in the market. And we ca call this the CEO mindset. They can be an individual contributor, a manager, director, a VP, not the CEO, but still we want them to have this CEO mindset that they're still running their own business, even if they have a W-2 role.
share a little bit about um, the the scale of uh, those are executives. How much? Uh, how do I say this? Uh, how much blackness do they display? Um, you know, in in older days, you know, you would try to kind of put that to the side. You would try to blend to get in, or um, uh, pardon me, guys, if this is wrong, but marry a white woman, or you know, have um, uh, you know, talk kind of real proper. You know, even though you come come from the hood, you're, you're speaking like that. Uh, what are, what are some of those those fears or some of the things that they feel that may have to adjust or think they have to adjust that they don't? Yeah, so there really is going to be a range um, of in terms of how kind of authentic, if you will, in their blackness guys are showing up. Um, you know, I think we all know that corporate's going to be an adjustment. It's a socializing process. So I could sit here and say you could just you know Black Panther it out. But you can't. You can't. That's not what's going on there. Um, it, it just maybe you can. Uh, I I just don't. I don't know because it, it gets pretty white. Uh, you know, the higher up you go in corporate, and so that code switching needs to be mastered. It does. It needs to be mastered to walk in that world. Um, if you have anything to do with talking to like shareholders or C-level or board roles, it's gonna be a pretty important part of being able to code switch. Now, I um, I had a client once, he was a brother at, uh, at IBM, and he was one of the early, kind of like the pioneers uh, in terms of being black men, I mean, just black employees there. And he was able to climb the rank. And when we met, the trauma that he had from constantly con contort contorting himself, uh, I think that's the word, uh, it was very significant. And we had to do a lot of healing work uh, because all the shifting and shape shifting that he had to do and all the slights and the put downs. There wasn't a there wasn't a black ERG. There wasn't like a black resource group like it wasn't like that then. So I think nowadays, though, there's a lot more room. Uh, the conversation around diversity, DEI, black ERGs, just even Black History Month with like constant pro uh, uh, different uh, black centered uh, programs happening all throughout February. There's a lot more awareness, my guess is now, than what it used to be for sure. Um, and then let alone, you know, Black Lives Matters was a real thing. I mean, there's a bunch of money poured in. It's now cleared out for the most part. But even that, well, things are shifting again. But for that window, there was just a lot more openness for conversations about what their real experiences are as black men in the corp corporate space, let alone in America in general. So I think it kind of ebbs and flows. Overall, I'd say it's probably moving in the right direction in terms of showing up authentic in the workplace. Um, but it's a real challenge, hence the need for networks like these and hence the networks uh, need for networks like fraternities and uh, uh, black focused and black centered uh, social and professional networking organizations. But that's going to be that's going to be a piece. It's definitely going to be a piece that, you know, I, I wish it wasn't that way. And that's kind of one of the reasons my organization exists to be that oasis for guys just to show up as themselves. Um, but that will be a piece of the puzzle for sure. You know, when I was uh, some years ago, I, I heard it described that as, um, you know, as you break through the glass ceiling, the thing to keep in mind are the shards of glass that can cut you as you break through. And sometimes you can be cut and you're starting to bleed and bleed out, not even realize it because you've you've permeated through that 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 barrier. Um, you've crossed over and, and, and now you've got to assimilate, you've got to moderate, um, almost become somebody that you're not, <clears throat> um, you know, when I think of Corp of America, there were, there were, you know, black males, they were those who had come up, um, affluent, you know, their, their parents were, were part of high society. They went, you know, they had the best of education private education they went to great schools um you know their 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 dad or the family were connected to people in the at the golf course and the community club and the, you know high society that kind of thing 
Uh, and then there were those who were um, who were intelligent, but also had some some street smarts, and they were able to sort of combine that too. I think that was very effective. Um, you know, speak to that a little bit in terms of that that uh, what called uh, dichotomy or diversity of of, of approach. And then um, and then we finish that. Uh, we've got some questions in the chat, so if you've got a question. Put it in the chat, and then uh, Robin. Hopefully, you, uh, I've been paying attention to what he's saying. I've been looking at the chat, so uh, when we have a when we have a great speaker. I'm like intent, and I'm not looking at the chat. <laughs> so, so Robin, help me out. Uh, go through that, and uh, after you finish this, Robin, take over and grab some of those uh, questions there. Uh, thank you. So, I mean, was the question you know? Kind the of question is the, the background. Those who are successful in 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 corporate America, obviously, I I think in some ways they have a leg up where they uh they came from affluence you know they came from money they went you know their the parents were there so they had sort of a bit of a road map and they had the money and then you got those who were just very intelligent very smart so they came up you know through they, they earned their way up there but they're now they get in that high uh i would call it high society but they get in that league and they're they're sort of out of the league they're fish fish out of water so to speak you know, it's interesting. This born driven thing. So the reason for that, even that name is because, man, I've met with some guys that have been born in some really tough scenarios. And so you'll have them in like, I'm just thinking of one guy and his two brothers, two brothers, one in prison, one barely getting by this guy, PhD, Michigan, rainmaker, crushing it. Um, does he downplay his blackness per se? I don't think so. Not, I don't. See, I think- He doesn't have a red, black, and green flag on his desk, but you know- No, but he wouldn't have it anyway. So that's yeah. the whole thing is like, there's a lot of variety in our community. And I think we put it on like, there's just one or the other. And that's one of the most amazing things that I've seen and working with the brothers is there's a lot going on in our community. It's not it's not so boiled down to it's this or it's that. Um, you, you, there's just a lot going on. Cause you, so with this guy, yeah, would you say, would I say he's pro black? Yes, I would definitely say he's pro black. Um, can he, you know, speak to the, you know to the governor and however the governor is talking yes he can do that and he just something in him i don't know if it's spiritual i don't know what i don't know where the born driven piece comes from but it just seems like there's people that are just kind of born to be there and they're 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 just kind of going to get there not everybody but but many in terms of guys that are born with the kind of the silver spoon piece of the puzzle um going to the private schools and whatnot um so you got the one of the first clients that i had yeah he 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 could move in that way as well but then you have him and he's questioning if he's accepted by the black community so he then he's got that dynamic going on so it's just there's a lot going on in terms of um uh uh, are you black enough? Do you fit in? Does the black community accept you? Does the white community accept? You? There's just a there's a lot of that going on, which I think leads to kind of whatever your background was, a level of social isolation at that level of success, which is why there's you know this need for other kind of organizations to exist. But probably whatever you're thinking, it, there's all of that going on. There's a lot of variety and diversity going on. Um, in senior leadership levels as well. And I even just quickly, I saw the question about kind of um, grooming children of the young, kind of younger generation who are also born driven. Uh, Renee put that in there is, I'd say pretty much all the guys that I met are impact driven. Now that may not be what they're talking about in the boardroom per se, but they have their ways of, many of them have their ways of giving back um, as well. So I think that's a common perception that they have left the community, don't care. Sure. Yes, there are definitely people like that. I mean, let's keep it 100. We got people in the community that are broke who are don't care. So the, the caring or not caring, I don't think that's an economic thing per se. Um, but there's a lot of guys that have reached very high that 
absolutely want to give back and are doing so uh, as well. But I love the conversation because we're getting to touch on the diversity and the variety that exists as well. Jewel, hey, it's Robin Billups. I've followed you. I have sons. I have two African-American males, um, sons and three grandsons. And I appreciate the fact that you've created a platform and a process for folks to get back to who God sent them here. God sends us, in my opinion, God sends us here with everything we need, but we allow so many other external things to navigate that, right? I love the, I, I love your thought process because at the end of the day, if you can mentally see it, you um, visualize it and own it, then it can manifest because that means you're gonna go find the help. The help, the the opportunity that you're creating, you I, all I was thinking while you were talking is you brought your personal experience, your lived experience to a situation. And because of your curiosity, you've created this platform that I we all applaud what you're doing. We totally applaud what you're doing. I spent um, a good 30 years in commercial real estate construction financing with the white boys. Yeah. But before I got there, my mom got me together mentally, right? And so part of it is to, I, I, I have an issue with folks talking about being your authentic self or the imposter syndrome. I have so many issues with these words that people create that really are just life. Can you speak to that a little bit? And then um, um, Stephen has a question. Absolutely. So it, uh, I'm just making sure I got it right. So speaking to imposter imposter syndrome well just the idea that you know every week there's a new word you know there's a new boxed in word that folks use i only know how to be robin right mm -hmm. i can't I, when when you say be my authentic self i only know how to be robin let me learn what you're doing is helping people learn how to be who they are not what what they do for a living not how they make their living not what something off of some shelf you're helping people to understand to be who they are. And when you're not being yourself, you're stressing your body out, you know, you're stressing your brains out. Talk to us. That I mean, that's absolutely correct. And uh, that that really is at the core of the work I do when I was doing psychotherapy, but also coaching is listening for who is this person? Yes. Really? Yes. Who are they at their core? Yeah. And then from there, um, I mean, there might be a bit of healing work that we kind of have to do, childhood trauma. There, there's still pieces of the puzzle that often relate to some level of healing for them to feel safe enough and comfortable enough with one other person to, to start to step into who they are and then expand it out from there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's very much at, at, at the core. Um, and then there's a the challenge of then doing that in corporate where they're navigating between brands and pressures and and, 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 uh, and a lot of white people and other people as well and trying to make their way up the ladder where they got to they got to work with other people. Uh, uh, it's like, you know, people got to give them that stamp to to a degree in order to elevate. But being their pro black self, what kind of what that looks like for them, though, however, that impact might be for them which might be giving back to the next generation or supporting the ERG program or having more black staff, something like that. And then weaving that into their professional identity uh, at the same time. That's a pretty common theme, but it does go back to not only their authentic self, but that anything is possible. And that really believing that God and spirit are on their side, not working against them. Mm -hmm. And that when they can align with that, they start to see how powerful they truly are in whatever situation it, that they're in. And that might lead to a decision they need to be in a new situation yeah. that allows them to flourish, either a new company, new role or entrepreneurial pursuits. That's excellent. You know, fear is what, what keeps a lot of folks from doing a lot of stuff. Stephen, you had a question? or comment well a question uh, you know many of us on this call have been in corporate america and currently we do have we're children that go into corporate america and the advice i give a lot of young people is don't try to start your own business go to a corporate make corporation go to google go to oracle learn as much as possible take every class that they're offering then you know later on but one thing I want you to ask you, uh, Jewel, is 
you have different sectors of regional chapters. Where are your chapters and, and what, what do they do in the different chapters? Sure. Um, so they all pretty much do the same thing is um, it's pretty much a chat group where guys get to talk about what's going on in their primarily professional life and get support around that. Uh, maybe it's a job referral. Maybe they're looking for funding and they want some resources around that or how to handle a situation that came up at work. Um, sometimes it'll be a bit personal, maybe about health or a goal that they have or hobbies, things of that nature. And then they have socials that are currently scheduled for quarterly where guys get to meet up um, in person. So but that's like quarterly, what's the get, up, uh, get together recently in New York and then there was one in Los Angeles, I believe. Yeah, so last week we had Los Angeles. A couple of weeks ago, there was New York. Uh, earlier, we had Atlanta. We have Texas coming up in a couple of weeks, Ohio in a couple of weeks, Chicago in a couple of weeks, um, Philly in a couple of weeks. DC had a social a couple of weeks ago. North Carolina was a couple of weeks ago. So um, guys are just excited to, to, to get together and, and network with one another. It's pretty pretty easy to do. The excitement is already there. Just one quick question before we switch over. Greg has his hand up. I want to I want to validate the fact that this is the black men's black executive men's collective. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's no co collective on it, per se. I mean, I'm sorry. Just it's just strictly focused on black men. I love that. Yep. Yeah. Or black man. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just clear clear that up for me. Yeah, ah, that's my jam. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, it's a community for black men, by black men. This specificity is kind of more so on corporate, mm -hmm. although we do have guys that are entrepreneurs. Uh, shout out to Michael who's he here with us today. Mm -hmm. uh, we have guys that are um, uh, military uh, mm -hmm. still. In the military, we have guys that are in government and nonprofit, but I, I'd say probably about probably about seventy percent are going to be corporate guys more directly. Um, the philosophy behind it is we have everything we need in our own community, and it's kind it's 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 that's the theory that we're going with. Now, yes, we know we love live in a global world. And we got shoes coming from China and food coming from Mexico. We get it. We understand. We 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 know that. There's something to be said about looking inside of our own community as um, people. in some cases first mm -hmm. in terms of resources uh, socially, uh, but then also very much from a business standpoint as well. And it's incredible. Like I'll just pick up my phone and the you know I'll, I'll roll over in the morning, pick up my phone. It's all charged up to 100, and the old green bar is there. And I take a look at the the chat group. Guys are sending each other job referrals. Check out this conference. You know, uh, uh, you can support my business in this way. So it's a lot of support that's already, even though we're pretty early on, already taking place and exactly. how we're supporting one another. And I think it's bringing a level of hope and possibility mm -hmm. that we can rely on one another and it's going to be an excellent experience in doing so. And that's what we're looking to build out. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. So I wanted to um, kind of go back to the authenticism, uh, you know, being authentic me or who that is. And I think you can, I, I kind of equate it to um, vehicles. All right. So old time vehicles, you got what you got. It, they were singular. Um, it was all mechanical. Uh, they were either designed for comfort. They were designed for racing. Um, they were for carrying things. Um, today, I, in fact, I, I can't remember the brand. It might have been Range Rover. There was something where uh, cars today are, are, are controlled by um, computers. And, and the transmission in the cars now have modes. So you've got a, a, a economy mode. You've got a sport mode. You've got an off-road mode. They've got one for snow. Um, so it's still the same vehicle. It's just that it adjusts for the environment and it adjusts for the conditions. Um, so I think you can still be your authentic, authentic self, but you make adjustments, you make change. Um, I'm a New Yorker, I'm a Brooklyn, I cuss. 
all right? But obviously I don't go up in church cussing, all right? So I have to make that adjustment. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I'm, I'm a New Yorker at heart, but I'm here in California. So I have to dial down. If I'm around other New Yorkers, my personality is a little different. It's a little more open and freer than when I'm dealing with folks who are not from New York because they don't they don't get us. Um, yeah, yeah, Robin's. Uh, yeah, she realized. <laughs> so you make adjustments, you make mode changes, um, and I think that's what it is. If you if you're in corporate, you can't act like you're around your family and say whatever you want and 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 do whatever you want. You've got to make those adjustments. Uh, if you're around your coworkers, obviously you're going to have to make that adjustment versus when you're dealing with clients. Um, so I, I think making those adjustments is key where, where what you do can provide that guidance. I think it's fabulous, uh, to have as a, as a resource. So I, I applaud you for putting that together. Um, and I think you can get, I think you can remain who you are. You just have to shift modes. You just got to turn that knob and, uh, go into sport mode or go into, uh, you know, smooth mode or, um, you know, aggressive, you can be aggressive and, and had that killer instinct, but now you're dealing with your four-year-old son. We can't treat your four-year-old son the way you would treat, you know, an hopefully not uh, an opponent. So, um, and, I hope that and, helps. It, and, it, and Greg, it to that point, I, I agree with you. And I was, when I was, Jill was talking earlier, it just kept coming to me. We code switch all the time. We code switch all day long. I think that what people tend to do is they, they totally segment their life. And, 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 and sometimes that you need to do that, but majority of times you need to align your life because some of these tools that Jewel is talking about, some of the things that you're, you're sharing, um, you use those in everyday life. You might use them in corporate, but you also use them in your everyday life too. So I think that we, um, um, I'm sorry, Greg. Okay, Greg, then I got slapped right there. Uh, let me be <laughs> quiet. Jewel, go right ahead. No, I was going to, I think these are, uh, uh, Greg, you're, you're you're definitely hitting the nail on the um, on the head, and uh, just kind of certain times and certain places for certain things. Like I didn't like I was saying, I didn't know corporate. I, there's a whole language that goes in corporate that I was writing down words. I yeah, sure, I knew the word, but I just in this context, I didn't know. And then I started to learn how to speak corporatese. So now you can drop me in a corporation. And I know what they're talking about. And I can talk that language as well. And so I think that's that's the, the kind of corporate education that guys go through, be it in you know MBA uh, uh, or a grad school or being in a corporation. And each corporation is a little different. Like Culture. in Google to agree, they'll say plus one. Mm -hmm. They might not say yes or I agree, they'll say plus one. And so learning those pieces I mean, if you're trying to move up the ladder and you're not saying plus one or whatever those things are to that corporate culture, it's not going to gel. You, you just kind of need to know for that culture, just like in speaking with your spouse or your children or your religious community. Uh, there's certain uh, words and phrases and manners, of body postures. You guys, you all know this goes deep. Um, that we're doing to move through all these many different worlds. Um, and then, you know, talking about the black community, we might say, you know, someone that looks like me or looks like us, as opposed to saying black folks or the black community. So even there, there's just little code switches to still kind of get at what you're trying to say, but it's, it is through this corporate lens and the filter. That, that's funny. But that, yeah, that's true. Corporate tease, I like that. Did you did corporate you make that up or is, I'm, I'm stealing it either, no matter if you did or not. Boy, corporate tease, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, man, this has been fabulous. We're, we're pushing right up at 12 o'clock here and, and running out of time. We could, um, you know, I, I, I think you worked with Steven, uh, Steven, we maybe can bring him back and, uh, later in the year to kind of do a part two, if you're, if you're okay with that, um, uh, Jewel. No, I absolutely love this. This is, this is, this is an incredible community you all have here. Yes. I mean, you all are showing up, engaging, learning, taking it, putting things into action. I'm sure this is. This is incredible. So yeah, I, I'd love to come back. Fantastic. Well, stand by, stay with us a minute. Steve, uh, Stephen, uh, come come on and introduce yourself. And who do we have next week? Well, first, Joe, thank you so much. And for those in the audience, he's 
making time for us. He's in Mexico. What, what city in Mexico? Ah, I didn't get to that. So, yeah, left the United States, racial pressure through the roof, moved to Mexico, Guadalajara, um, and Jalisco. So, same same state as uh, Puerto, Vallarta, Puerto Vallarta for those that go down there for vacationing. But, uh, yeah, it's just chill. All right. I might be joining in a few more weeks out there. Uh, yeah, next week yeah. we have and, and Jalisco is the home of tequila, so I, I, you got uh, me there. Uh, <laughs> well, next week we have Dr. Robert D. Brown built upon the, the concept of black male development. And Robin, really, I thank Robin for this because Robin says we have so many females on the community briefing. Let's have some men. And so we have uh, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Cool, cool. This, Jewel, this has been exceptional, you guys. If you follow him on LinkedIn, let's help him grow his audience as he's going to help us grow us, our audience with this presentation. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because, you know, Black women, as I always tell folks, you know, when that chick wrote that book about lean in, when, when have we been able to lean back? <laughs> so we, we're leaning in with you. We're here to support you. We we want our black men to lead. We want that. We want that. But black women are who brought men into this world. So we will, you know, we got to move into the position to help move, move things forward. We'll do that. But we would we love the idea that you that we have this platform, that we have a great group of guys that dial in here every week, and now you become a part of our family. Thank you. Love yeah. it. Thank you all. This is a great circle. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay. Thank you for joining the community briefing and come back next week to uh, join us. Now, the challenge is going to be, Crystal, I have no idea. Is Crystal still around? Can you stop no. the recording? <laughs> well, she might be able to hear us. Uh, let's see. How do I stop the recording? Jane, stop this crazy thing. Stop. <laughs> I got to jump, guys. I'm not supposed to be on at 12 o'clock. I've been working on some um, community activity around housing and ownership in particular. And um, we just we have to keep pushing because the money is out there. The money is out there. And when I when, while we're waiting to, to unplug, I will also say that Michael Anderson truly we're recording, but we're off of we're off of Facebook. That's OK. Yeah. Michael Anderson truly appreciates the support that the community briefing has brought to him and so that we can move forward this master plan for infrastructure, transit and ownership housing in the BIPOC community. So everybody have a wonderful day. And Jewel, thank you again. It just would you just warmed our hearts and gave us hope. <laughs> Take care, everybody. All right, so uh, this is sort of like the after session here. For those who want to hang out, we're still recording, but we're off of Facebook. Um, you said Jalisco, so I, I did my uh, uh, my DNA analysis, and apparently 8% of my DNA comes out of the Jalisco, Mexico area. So I don't know where that's from. I think it's from my uh, maternal grandfather, as, as I believe that uh, is, is the case there. So. Uh, when I discovered that, it's like, okay, well, that's that explains why I love tequila. So it's just, it's just heritage. You just love tequila. And, you didn't, you didn't need the DNA for that. And uh, so, and I see you have African American and Scottish Canadian. Uh, so share a little bit about that. Was what side of the family is, and have you been to Scotland? Uh, have you been to Canada? So yeah, no, definitely. That's really kind of a, a recent. Um, there's kind of a recent advancement on that, if you will, in that. So we got a brother who is in Ireland and he joined the black executive and community. And I'm like Ireland, your brother in Ireland. I, I guess it's like an ignorant thing to think or say, but I, you know, I just didn't know that much. So he's like, yeah, we're out here and there's not, you know, yeah, there's, there's quite a few of us, but we're not so connected. And that's one thing that you all have in the States is there, you all have a lot of connection and we were kind of dumb. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, cultural differences. And I started asking him about like Scotland, <laughs> like what's going on in Scotland? Uh, Cause I got roots there as well. And he just started telling me about some of the drinking culture. And I guess he had spent a year there. It's like, they drink a lot in Scotland. I'm like, 
Cool. I mean, so for me, it's, I was like, oh, so my mom, Scottish Canadian, father, African American. And my mom's side of the family, yeah, they would they would talk about they would talk about Scotland a a bit and some of the cultural traditions as well. But them being immigrants, it was kind of about a, a degree was about leaving that behind, like leaving the old world and the old country behind, and Canada as well, and just becoming like trying to become American and Americanized as well. So my mom has never been to Scotland. I've never been to Scotland. My uncle has. Um, but yeah, I think I was always worried about, you know, like what's the racial dynamic? Like, am I going to, is it going to be a problem going there? Like what's going to happen? But finding out that there's a black community and group there, I just feel much more safe and comfortable. And I may not need to think that way at all. Uh, but it comes up. And, uh, so that was really inspiring to see. He sent me a video of them, um, they just had a social in uh, Ireland and they had the whole Celtic music playing in the background. It was just phenomenal to see this like mixture going on. So, uh, yeah, hopefully one day I can get I can get out to Scotland. I, I involuntarily ended up in Ireland uh, once uh, I was, was actually on a plane uh, coming back from Europe to to the U.S. and a um, passenger got sick so we actually i mean i think the passenger died yes uh, but we had to turn around and um shannon ireland is like the most uh western part of europe where planes can land uh, it's like in a, the, the first place where they can emergency landing uh crystal says let me know if you're ready me to stop the recording um still yes. recording yeah we're still recording but we're not we're off of facebook so right. crystal controls the recording Mm -hmm. And she can edit it. Uh, I was just recording to her cloud, but I was successful in stopping the live stream to, uh, to Facebook. So whatever we said is still within this room and being recorded, but it's not out to the world. We get the Scottish Jameson <laughs> questions coming. In. I don't yeah. drink, so I stopped drinking about uh, two years ago, something like that. And um, I don't know what to do when I get there. I'm like, my, got my, some carrot my and sympathies and condolences to you. Stop here, drinking. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Anyone else had a question? I, Emma, I think you had a question. I don't know if we got to that. I was. That, uh, I don't worry about it. I sent it directly to Jewel. So he okay. answered it for me. Thank you. All right. Um, All right. I wanted to also tell you guys that I don't know if you guys remember Kitty Black who came on the um, our, our meeting and she made the first black Barbie doll. Do you guys oh, cool. remember her? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Anyway, just I want to let you know that she's very grateful for doing that. And since she launched that meeting, she's going to, um, they're making the Netflix uh, movie about her. It opens on the 19th. Uh, Good morning, America is going to fly her out on the 19th, and she'll be there to talk about the Netflix uh, documentary. And she was commissioned to do the uh, next Black Barbie doll for their anniversary, um, Mattel's anniversary. So be looking for that. And uh, she's very excited about it. And she contributes her uh, notoriety to you guys for having her on the briefing. You know, it was, uh, it was interesting. I um, uh, when I came out of out of college, I worked for a, one of the big eight CPA firms, and uh, and in Manhattan, so it was very, very, very corporate. Um, and it wasn't my first day, but it was in um, it was early on, and I showed up, you know, suit and tie, but I had on a sort of ivory colored shirt, and they sent me home. They said, "No, you can only have." white shirts on i said well this is kind of off-white they're like no right so i wasn't going home so i went to macy's and bought another shirt um and it you know came back and you know changed in the men's room and and put it on but it was just that the culture the things that you just don't know how you know how buttoned down I mean, obviously this was this was quite a while ago and, and um and we were divided up into teams 
So though there was a team one, two, three, and four, team one were the ones who were very the the elite. You know, they're 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 uh, they came from the country club um, uh, sphere, and then um, uh, team four was the uh, uh, those who were of um, um, mixed heritage and Jewish were in team four. And I did looking back to see that, but it was just interesting being thrown into the this culture of trying to adapt, you know, trying to, uh, to, to manage and change and not having a blueprint, not having a roadmap, just trying to figure it out. And I, you know, I, I look back at how many men were able to navigate that, how many failed, they didn't get the memo, they didn't know what it was. Um, and now you hit that, uh, it's not the glass ceiling, you hit the cement ceiling, you know, and, and uh, you're just, you know, shoved out the door or, or you, you don't get promoted you start seeing, you know, uh, coworkers promoted uh, uh, above you, and people that came under you. And you train them now; they're your boss, you know. So that that dynamic was uh, was pretty pretty significant back then, and I imagine a lot of that still persists today. Yeah, it, it absolutely does. Uh, just in terms of uh, just that cultural piece and having that awareness, it's a trip though, because. Um, or not though, it's a trip. So being in this group, I'm learning so much in that, um, yeah, when I grew up, we played mini golf, right? That was about the extent of it. And that was a lot of fun. But in this group, we got guys that are all over the United States and they just nerd out on golf. So there's golf, there's bourbon, bourbons, there's cigars. There's just this certain culture that they know about somehow some way somewhere they pick that up and so now for instance in washington dc they've got a golf golf trip planned for the guy and they're talking about it in new york as well and they're about to go out and play golf and do the thing and and so these are the pieces these are i think people might see them as optional and they kind of are but the cultural pieces are essential to move up in corporate it's not it's not so optional as people think. Like these are kind of required. They don't have to go play golf per se, but there are certain cultural pieces that you kind of need to do to to advance. So I'm I'm literally at the age of 41, going on 42 in August. I'm just now learning some of these key pieces that guys are using to advance to higher and higher levels of seniority. Yeah, the challenge. 20 years ago, I was. 25 42 minus 25 who's got the answer who's got 17 is that right is that it 17 i was in high school <laughs> i was a junior in high school <laughs> having fun and uh <laughs> playing playing tennis in in high school in alameda high uh alameda uh encinal high school so that that story i told you about the shirt that was uh 1979 so uh, you know the the the, the gray shirt or the the white shirt, yeah. So, yep. All right, well, guys. Well, it was uh, wonderful. Thank you again, Jewel. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, if there are any other questions, this was this was a fabulous uh, show. Um, Crystal will edit it down, and uh, it will be available on um, our YouTube channel sometime next week. Uh, thanks. And, and obviously that you have the link, uh, come back and join us. Um, you don't, you can come in and we have a number of, uh, different topics. Um, I think you should be on our, uh, list now to get the, um, announcements of who's coming. So come awesome. back and check us out. Greg, I appreciate it to the community. Thank you as well. Thank Peace you. Peace and love. Bye-bye. Bye. Renee and Keith, yep, waiting for you. Okay, good.